Welcome to this installment of the course Optimization Methods for Machine Learning and Engineering. Today we will see a couple of application examples. Before we go into the examples, what is the uh, selection process? Why did we choose the examples the way we did? And for this, let's go back to the Middle Ages and the seven liberal arts. So in the Middle Ages, the education was structured into the several liberal arts. Those were um, well, the, the arts that were free from uh, well, the normal labor of artisans or of peasants. So a free man who wasn't a butcher or a, a peasant who didn't have to work for his livelihood, he could pursue the seven liber liberal arts and after that maybe even follow a university education which is theology, law, or medicine, and so on. And uh, the liberal arts were further grouped into the trivium and the quadrivium. The trivium is focused on, on text and on writing, and uh, the education of a child would start with the trivium. So first of all, logic or dialectic, how to think, how to, how to get to a logical conclusion. Secondly, grammar, which back in the day was mostly Latin, but also Greek and, and Hebrew, not the, not the common vernacular of the people. So the grammar, how to express the thought, how to write it down, how to communicate it to other people. And then lastly, rhetoric, how to convince people. So these three were all um, on going into a, a, the similar direction, how to get to a logical conclusion, that is true, how to write that down, how to express it, and how to convince people. Today even we have um, the word trivial in our vocabulary. So if something is very easy, we call it trivial, and this stems from the trivium, because back then the trivium were all the subjects that even a child would already learn. And after the trivium, there was the so-called quadrivium, and uh, it changed the focus from words to numbers or to mathematics. So in the trivium, there were four subtopics. The first one is algebra, so numbers, how to compute. The second was geometry, relating, relating numbers to space. Uh, so back then they had the books, for example, from Euclid, containing geometric proofs. And uh, well, here geometry was, was how to compute uh, about or how to reason about geometry and how to think about numbers in, in space. The third one, music, was about numbers in time, so adding to the space dimension the time dimension. And lastly, astronomy, astronomy about numbers in space and time, and this was the most difficult of the subjects. So what you see here on the right hand side, uh, this is a picture from the Hortus Deliciarum, which was an encyclopedia back in the Bay, or, and um, this was a book for, for, for pedagogical purposes. And it comes from the, the library of Herat of Landsberg, and she was the abbess of a monastery uh, quite close to Karlsruhe. So uh, she was a contemporary of, of Hildegard von Bingen, as uh, you might know her in Germany, Herat of Landsberg, um, she was the abbess of the uh, St. Odile Monastery. And uh, today this is France in the Alsace region and uh, the St. Odile Mountain is maybe um, one hour, one and a half away from Karlsruhe. So there are also very nice uh, hiking tours uh, around St. Odile. So you can walk from the so-called Lützelburg to, to Saint Odile, it's quite nice. And uh, it, it has historical importance and um, you see here now this image from back in the day uh, where they were explaining the, the seven liberal arts and so this is a, a reference to, 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 to the history of, of this region. Okay, and in this lecture we pick up this topic and uh, we will talk about numbers in space. Uh, this will be a design of a bridge. So it's called mechanical truss design and we will be designing a bridge that is as lightweight as possible and therefore solve an optimization problem. 
The second one is about numbers in time, about stock market investments. So how to invest your money in a way that over time it will gain value and uh, how to think about the trade-off between the expected revenue and the risk associated with, it, with that revenue. And lastly, model predictive control. So how to take a physical system, reason about its behavior and improve the behavior of a physical system. Uh, this will be then uh, um, the, the analogon to thinking about numbers in space and time. Before we drop into these three examples, we have one more subject to cover, which is about some difficulties that arise when we use the Lagrangian approach for equality constraints with linear programming. So in the last lecture, we have seen two different approaches to handle equality constraints. First of all, constraint elimination and second, linear, um, the, the Lagrangian approach. And uh, for the constraint elimination approach, we could solve the Kantorovich problem, so moving the soldiers and moving the soldiers in an economical fashion from, from barracks to, to their uh, fighting positions. And, uh, but we haven't concluded um, the, the lecture by using the second approach, the Lagrangian approach, to solve the same problem, because there are a couple of difficulties associated with that. And uh, we will show them today and also show how to get around these difficulties. So initially we might think that combining the equality constraints approach of the Lagrangian with the interior point method is quite trivial. So for the Kantorovich problem we have equality and inequality constraints. So somehow we have to combine the, the solution methods for, for both. And um, so we might think it's rather trivial because we can just uh, create some augmented target function that uh, contains our original problem which was linear for the Kantorovich problem and then also co that contains then also the logarithmic barriers uh, depending on some uh, parameter t where we can increase the tightness of the border over time. And we can think, okay, instead of f, let's just plug f tilde into our Lagrangian and then we will get some Lagrangian tilde that is then also parameterized by little t. And uh, we can just iteratively solve the Lagrangian and then increase t, solve the Lagrangian and so on. And uh, if that, for many problems, that can be done. And um, in, in essence, this is then an approach that, that works, that converges to, to the optimum. But in this case, we have a slight problem. So for the, for the Lagrangian here, when we plug in our F tilde, you see that the F tilde originally, or the original target function, was a linear function and we were just adding the, the barrier. And um, what you ask, have to ask yourself is, what is the Hessian of this f tilde here? Well, first of all, let's look at the Hessian of f. So let's just take here um, the Hessian of f. And um, since this is a linear function, if we are deriving two times, then the second derivative will be zero everywhere. So the Hessian of the original target function is zero everywhere. And the problem with this target function is that we cannot invert it, or we cannot invert the Hessian because it's zero everywhere. Uh, now, since we are having here the additional log barrier, we will have some more entries. And in this case, we will have some more entries here on the diagonal. So here we will have, I don't know, A, B, C, and so on, some entries on the diagonal. However, when we are far enough from the barrier, then these entries on the diagonal will be pretty small. And again, it will be numerically difficult to, to find the inverse of, of this uh, Hessian. Uh, but let's look at the actual numbers and uh, what arrives. So uh, here on this slide, we have the implementation of the optimization problem for the Kantorovich problem. 
Uh, let me go over that really quick. So here we are defining the basic um, constraints of the Kantorovich problem. Uh, we have the objective function that we want to solve. We construct our f tilde, which um, is the objective function plus the logarithmic barrier. And then we construct the Lagrangian that is then combining the uh, inequality and the, in and the equality constraints by having uh, the, the f tilde as part of the Lagrangian. And uh, what happens now if we take the original point or the starting point that we had defined in the previous lecture and plug that in? then we will find that the Hessian is not invertible at that point. So now we see how the, how the Hessian looks like and um, we can clearly see um, in the spy plot what the different components are. So a spy plot is, a, is an image that shows, uh, a 2D image that shows the matrix and all the elements of the matrix that are zero are white or transparent and all the other elements are black. And here we see, okay, this is um, the second derivative of the f tilde, where we only have some elements on the diagonal. And then the other entries here, so these are then our matrix A from the equality constraints, and this is A transposed. So here we, we find the definition of the, of the Lagrangian, um, or of the Hessian of the Lagrangian, we find that uh, precisely in, in this by plot. And now if we evaluate this Hessian matrix at the initial point, uh, then we will find out that it has a determinant of zero and cannot be inverted. So the Newton method cannot be applied. And for us, this is problematic because we are optimizing a, a Settle point, and we want to find the settle point of the Lagrangian, and uh, we cannot do that by just using gradient descent because it would overshoot and go even below the settle point. And uh, so here we we cannot apply the methods as we had originally intended. Now let's look at this settle point topic a little bit more. Um, on the right hand side, this is a really easy example. This is just f of x and y is x times y and uh, this function has a single saddle point at exactly 0 and 0. And um, then uh, you see that this doesn't have a global minimum because if we wanted to minimize and we're using gradient descent then we would just walk down down here and be unconstrained and we could walk down infinitely far and uh, our solutions wouldn't converge. There is no global minimizer here. And um, so this is the uh, this is one example for a settle point. And uh, if we just compare the the look of uh, this f of x function here and um, the Lagrangian, then we see that it is somehow similar. So again, here we are multiplying two elements that we are both uh, optimizing over. So here we are optimizing or could be optimizing over x and y in the top here and now we are optimizing over x and lambda and uh, the, both of them are multiplied here and this is a, a strong hint that there will be a settle point. And uh, one can prove that the Lagrangian term if f of x is strongly convex has exactly one settle point that we want to find and this works brilliantly with the Newton method because the Newton method will converge to the point where the gradient is zero and the settle point is the place where the gradient is zero. Uh, however, we can no longer use the Newton method here. Okay, what can we use instead? And there are a couple of elements that are uh, combined for the solution and uh, let's see here the first element which is Uzawa's method. Hirofumi Uzama, he is a, or he was a researcher from Japan, worked mainly in economics, but also uh, he discovered important results in, in mathematics that he then also directly employed and used in his work on, on economics, so describing the economy. And um, what he developed, uh, Uzawa's method, 
is splitting the optimization. So initially we would uh, here um, directly work on the Lagrangian and we would try to find a point where the minimizer, where the gradient of the Lagrangian with respect to x and lambda is zero. So this is what we try to find. And uh, what he does is he's splitting this up in two steps that are repeated iteratively. And the first step of the iteration is to fix the lambda and to minimize over the x. Yeah. So here we call it y to, 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 to distinguish, but now we are minimizing over the first part y. And uh, so here this f of x, f of x, this is strictly convex. And so when we keep the, the lambda fixed here, then we will again end up with a strictly convex term because we are just then adding here something linear to the end, something affine. And uh, if we have a strictly convex function and we add an affine term, it will remain um, uh, strictly convex. And so we are now minimizing over this first part, keeping the lambda fixed. And then we update the lambda in a second step uh, by looking at how strongly the different equality constraints are violated. And for the constraints that are violated more strongly, uh, this lambda will be strengthened and will be given more importance, so to say. And uh, one can show that if we have this rho larger than zero, but small enough, then this will converge. However, convergence doesn't have to be fast, and actually, in this case, it will, it will be rather slow. The second ingredient is the so-called augmented Lagrangian. So, first of all, an observation, we see that for a solution x star, that is the minimizer, we will have ax minus b equals zero. So, this is the initial uh, equality constraint and we know that all the solutions, the admissible solutions, uh, will hold this, um, this term. And from this we also know that the, the norm of ax minus b will be exactly zero. Let's have uh, another insight and uh, this is a, a theorem from the 50s and uh, the, what we want to uh, achieve here is that our Hessian matrix again becomes positive definite. So we want to be in a situation where we can invert um, the Hessian of the Lagrangian. So here we have our uh, initial matrix H that is not necessarily invertible and we want to modify it in a way that it becomes invertible and there's this theorem by De Bru that uh, if we have a second matrix um, that uh, fulfills uh, that with a second condition um, that whenever jx equals zero um, then the original matrix um, with x transposed hx is greater than zero and uh, if that is the case then we can select some rho sufficiently large such that h plus rho j transpose j is positive definite. Okay, that's maybe a mouthful. Maybe one has to think a little bit about that. Um, this is essentially a motivation to augment the Lagrangian with an additional term. And what we are adding to the Lagrangian is here ax minus b and then the squared norm of that times rho divided by 2. And um, why does this make sense? So we can unpack here this Euclidean norm notation and get to rho divided by 2, ax minus b transpose times ax minus b. And uh, now when we compute the first and the second derivative of this term, we will end up with the Hessian of the original objective function plus rho a transposed times a. And this looks kind of similar to this guy up here, from which it was shown that it is, it has to be positive definite. 
and we also know because uh, here of the, the left hand observation that we have not moved the position of the optimizer because in the optimum so here when we let x go to x star we know that this red term here it will be exactly zero so in the optimum or in all the solutions where the equality constraint hold here this term will be exactly zero but what we get from this term is additional curvature in the hashing and um, the conditions from up here, uh, so the conditions for this theorem, they, they don't hold in every case, but this is a strong motivation to look for the rho that makes our Hessian of the Lagrangian, of the new Lagrangian, uh, positive definite. However, we might have to increase this rho to a quite large number to overcome um, the numerical problems, to have um, an invertible uh, Hessian. However, when this rho becomes too large, then it can overpower the uh, normal objective function and then we run into new numerical problems where we uh, need a long, long time to converge. So also this augmented Lagrangian, if we take this purely, um, then um, convergence can be really slow. But what people have done and what they did already 50 years ago is to combine the approach of Uzawa's method with the augmented Lagrangian. And this is Powell's method. Um, so we will not use Powell's method in, in the exercises. Um, this is but only to show how the building blocks, the ingredients that we saw so far, can be combined into a solution method that can solve more or less every optimization problem that is convex. Because we have the possibility to express inequality constraints, we have the ability to express equality constraints, we can treat any uh, strongly convex optimization problem. So uh, what we see here is, a, or what we will have, um, is a pretty universal solution method. However, it will be really small. And then what will be interesting uh, in the lecture is how we improve this over time and uh, we will track how the different uh, tools and uh, theories that we will be learning how they lead to an improvement in the solving speed and uh, so that uh, you see where these improvements over the last 50 years are coming from uh, so that we today have fast solvers that can uh, run optimization problems with millions of variables Okay, but what Powell's method does, um, just in, in a nutshell, is uh, we no longer have a single scalar rho, but we now have a weight rho for all the different equality constraints. And uh, what they are doing is um, they construct here a matrix with all the entries of rho on the diagonal. So here they have a matrix that has then here you know, rho one, and row two and row three and so on. On the diagonal, all the other entries are zero. And this, uh, in this term, it leads to a scaling of the different equality constraints independently of one another. So row one is scaling the first equality constraint, row two is scaling the second equality constraint and so on. And then we can uh, remove this overpowering um, of the original objective function by only scaling up the importance of the equality constraints that are problematic or that need a little bit more, more, more control. So again here we, we have uh, Usava's method uh, integrated. So we are firstly minimizing our Lagrangian and keeping the rho and keeping the lambda fixed. Uh, second, we have a look at whether we have to change the rho if we have to make the the weighting of one of the equality constraints stronger and if yes then we do that if not we will adjust the um, the lambda here and now you see this strong relation to the uh, Uzawa's method and this guy here probably because we want this to be vectorial Probably this has to be Dayek. 
of the vector rho times c so that we end up with a vector expression in the end. Okay, um, so today, 50 years later, this is somehow outdated. We are a lot more performant with our methods today. Um, however, many of the building blocks are still um, in place and uh, we will gradually close the gap and make the improvements to get to the performance solvers that we have today. And we will also have some simplification. So in some sense, we have to add a theory that is more powerful, but for on the algorithm side, you will also see some simplification so that in the end we have something that is very short, only a few lines of code and still a really performance solver. So the method as it is shown on the previous slide, Powell's method, we can combine it now with the inequality constraint handling of the interior point method. So we can now use Powell's method, but instead of F, we can have F tilde uh, depending on, on T, so how strongly, how tight we want the barrier to be. And then we can iteratively uh, solve uh, the optimization problem with the Lagrangian increase, the, 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 the tightening of the barrier and repeat. And uh, what you see on this slide is how exactly this performs. And we see it does converge, however it converges really slowly. So here we need hundreds of iterations to uh, somehow converge. And even then, haven't, didn't we arrive at the, the global optimum? We have only approximated it. Uh, so look at the result. Even when we are rounding, for example, here we would end up with, uh, I don't know, 52,000 soldiers doing a certain uh, movement. Um, and I think the, the, the ground truth from the previous lecture was 55 in this case. So you see that we have converged and um, um, uh, we have gotten really close to the global optimum, but we didn't exactly reach the global optimum. And um, well, in the last 50 years, have, people have worked to, to remedy this situation. And today we have solvers that are still conceptually very close to what we saw with Powell's method, for example, the Lancelot or the Eigenkahn method, um, but they were adding and adding, um, how to say, band aids, uh, or um, the the underlying ideas. Many were uh, many of the underlying ideas are still the same, uh, but then we were adding heuristics to solve the the upcoming problems, and uh, so these are solvers that are performant and we can scale them up to millions of variables and that works. Uh, however, what we will see at the end of this course is that uh, we don't have to add heuristics and band-aids to a method that works but doesn't scale, but there are also approaches that give us a really clean solver and a clean theory behind that and uh, which is still very, very performant.